My name is Max Sklar, and I am an engineer, sometimes engineer slash data scientist uh, at Foursquare. And I work on our recommendation engine, um, and I, I do a lot of work on our uh, natural language processing stack, which um, I give a lot of talks about that sometimes at various meetups. Um, and I also like to look at some more, you know, kind of theoretical issues in uh, Bayesian statistics and machine learning in my spare time, which is kind of more what I'm talking about today, but I like to bring it into my work sometimes, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's mostly about me. Uh, this talk uh, does have a dedication. I know that's a little bit unusual, but uh, Meyer Marx uh, is my grandfather, and unfortunately, he passed away last week. Uh, and I used to talk to him about this stuff sometimes, and I know that he would be here if, uh, if he could. So let's get started. Okay. This, my friends, is the Dirichlet distribution. Everyone get it? All right, good. I can go now. No. Um, all right, this is, I mean... Some of you are like, oh yeah, this makes sense, I know this. So just, just, I'm just curious just to get a show of hands. How many of you already know what this is and what this represents, this equation? All right, so I think about like, maybe about a quarter of you. That's good. So believe it or not, if you want to teach someone about the Dirichlet uh, distribution, it's pretty clear. If you just throw this up on the screen, it's not really going to do much for you. Um, you might understand all the symbols in that equation. You might even be able to like, parse what it's doing. Um, but I don't really like to learn things like that. I like to kind of understand, um, understand what the heck is actually going on. Uh, so this talk is going to be more focused on building intuition as to what this distribution is, why it's important in statistics, and why we could use it in Bayesian statistics and machine learning. Um, so let's start with something a little simpler. Uh, how about something that everyone here I, I think could understand? A pie chart. Everybody understands a pie chart. Uh, in this case, we've got uh, you know, six, uh, five different possible um, values, and there's different percentages on each. I think we all, all, can, like, all can, can parse this. Um, so this is also known as a discrete distribution or a multinomial distribution. It just means that, hey, there are five different categories. We're uncertain which category is going to be selected. And here are the, here's the breakdown. Here's the percentages that we think. So we're going to introduce k. You notice that uh, back, back here there was a k. We're going to introduce k as the number of possible categories. In this case, k is 5. So let's look at some examples for, of multinomial distributions. And these, these are some that I look at like every single day at work. So this one is the distribution of positive and negative signals or positive and negative reviews on Foursquare for different Foursquare venues. If you look at a, you know, a venue like here, k is 2. There's likes and dislikes. If you look at a place like McNally Jackson Bookstore, uh, it's going to have a very different distribution than the 14th Street Post Office, which everybody hates. Um, another one, now, now here, here we have a little more complicated because K is uh, 168. Uh, the week is broken up into 168 different hours, and you know, it goes from week hour zero, which is uh, Monday morning from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m all the way to week hour uh, 167. And so what this means is this is just the distribution of people going there throughout the week. The highest one, which is like uh, Friday afternoon, you can see it goes to about 3.5%. That means that 3.5% of people who go to um, the Museum of Modern Art go at that time. You know, you can see Tuesday is a little lower because it used to be closed on Tuesday. Um, before we had a pie chart, why isn't this a pie chart? All right, you want a pie chart? I'll give you a pie chart. Here you go. Same data in a pie chart. OK, uh, that's why we don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is also a 168 dimensional vector, or, or the dimensional distribution. Uh, but this is for words. Uh, and, and we use these to make timely recommendations. So uh, the green, uh, sorry, the uh, red line is pancakes, and the blue line is burgers. So we kind of use curves like this to show that um, pancakes, uh, or, or to have the, our, our recommendation automatically learn that pancakes are good for earlier in the day, you know, there's a bigger, 
there's a bigger uh, range in the weekend and then later in the day, you know, particularly the spike at lunch and dinner for hamburgers. So, okay, what does the raw data look like? We don't get pie charts in our raw data. We don't get multinomial distributions in our raw data. We only get counts. So when we look at our, our database, or, or usually this is, this is uh, uh, produced, it's, it's an aggregate list. Um, we just get accounts, and then the number of columns are, uh, represent the, uh, the, the number of different values. So there are k columns of data, not counting the first column, it's just the ID. And then there are n rows of data, so there could be lots and lots of different rows. And the problem with that, or problem, or, or things I should point out, is that uh, the counts and the multinomial distribution are not the same thing. But you can calculate one for the other. So you could estimate the multinomial from the count. So in this case, we've got three categories. This is like, you know, I'm thinking cars stopped at a traffic light. How many hit the green light? How many hit the yellow light? How many hit the, the red light? Um, and you've got, you've got these, these three digit numbers in there in that first row. So we can calculate for that traffic light, you know, what percentage of, of people hit, hit each color. So we'll sum them up. We'll get to uh, 750 and then divide, pretty simple. Awesome, we get some percentages, very easy. Okay, so there's no problem. Until we start to look at something like this. Uh, here we have one, this traffic light, we don't really have a whole lot of data for this traffic light. So we're going to get 25%, 50%, and 25%. Um, and that looks okay, but um, now you're starting to wonder, this is really not as accurate as it was before, is it? In this one, we only have one piece of data, and it's yellow. So does that mean we're willing to say that 100% uh, of, of the people who hit this traffic light are, are yellow? Is, it, is yellow 100% of the time? I would think that's a, that's, that's a crazy inference to make. And now, now we're just dividing by zero. We have no data, and uh, you know, if you're not careful, you're going to throw an exception. So. Bayesian statistics to the rescue to sort of model what's going on here and, um, and uh, you know, to, to, to um, put into mathematics what we kind of know intuitively is going on here. Um, we're still gonna, going to assume that each row was generated by a multinomial distribution, but we just don't know which one. Could be any one. And what we're going to do is we're going to model this with a Dirichlet distribution. That's what it is. It's a probability distribution over all possible multinomial distributions, all possible pie charts that you can get. So it represents our uncertainty over what the actual distribution is that created the data in that row. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the equation again. We're not gonna uh, uh, do more with it, but, but we're going to look at what uh, some more of these values represent. So uh, P represents the probability, uh, or the multinomial distribution. Uh, alpha is the parameters of the Dirichlet, so each Dirichlet distribution is parameterized by K, uh, a k-dimensional vector alpha, and then K is still the number of categories. So you want to know what the probability is of P, the multinomial distribution, given the alpha, given the Dirichlet. And then we're going to want to update it. So what does that mean? Well, each row starts off with a Dirichlet to represent our uncertainty over the multinomial, and then as more data comes in for that row, we can update that, uh, that Dirichlet, and we can update what we think the multinomial is, going to, is for that row. And it gets more and more precise as we collect more data. Unfortunately, if you, do the, uh, if you apply Bayes' rule and use the math, and you take the Dirichlet uh, distribution, and you update it with data, the output, you do all the math, I recommend you do it, it's actually, it's kind of fun when it actually all works out, is that the result is another Dirichlet distribution with different alphas. So um, that means that you could stay in Dirichlet land the whole time, and you don't have to leave this, uh, 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 this one form of distribution. Uh, so that's why it's also known as a, a conjugate prior. Um, and, yet, and guess what? It's, there's something even better about it. Uh, if these are your three alphas, you have uh, one alpha for green, one alpha for yellow, one alpha for red. If you apply another data point to that row, say a yellow, that's equivalent to just, all you have to do is add one to the yellow column. 
Now this is great. Now this is uh, really easy to update. Um, so let's look at why this works. Let's take a, let's take a closer look uh, to see why that, uh, to, to get a handle on why that works. And we're going to introduce a concept called entropy, which you might be aware of. Um, another name for entropy, it has a lot of different names. It's also called information or information content. Um, sometimes it's known as energy. Uh, in machine learning, and I, a lot of times we're trying to minimize uh, energy function. And oftentimes, energy is represented as the entropy of a specific value. Um, it's also known as the log likelihood, or minus the log of the, uh, the probability. So let's look at some actual values here of, uh, of entropy. So uh, an event that's certain, that you're absolutely certain is going to happen, contains, when it happens, it contains no information to you. So it has zero entropy. Uh, when a coin flips and the coin lands on tails, then that's one bit of information. And it's a, you know, you could see that kind of spikes a little bit. So when a pair of dice, you roll them and it lands on six, that's a little higher. Uh, if the dice, uh, if it lands on 12, that's even higher entropy because there's only one, there's only one configuration of the dice that was, uh, possible to land on 12, whereas there's multiple ones as possible to land on 6. Um, I pulled out some more data from our Foursquare corpus for any given word to be the word delicious um, is that high, and then for any word to be cronut is much higher because it can only get cronuts in certain places. And the winning number for the Powerball lottery is the highest one on this chart. So, okay. Let's look at this again, and let's look at it in terms of entropy. Now I want to point out, this whole block is just a normalizing constant. All it does is make sure that the probability distribution adds up to one. All, all the numbers have to add up to one. And it uses the gamma function. It's like the factorial function. The uh, most often given definition of the gamma function is basically an integral. So it's almost defined by definition to be used to be a normalizing constant for these types of distributions. So this is just a constant term, and we can ignore it if we don't really care, uh, if we want to just get the ratio of uh, the probability of different events, we don't really want to normalize the whole thing. So we can not take a look at that. So let's look at the, um, uh, the entropy, or, or, the, or create an energy function for this probability uh, by taking minus the log, all right? So that's what it looks like now. Um, and as we, um, um, as you might be aware, the uh, log of a product is um, the sum of the logs. So we'll put that in there. Um, and then you notice the last term is uh, minus the uh, log of um, p sub k. And p sub k is the probability uh, you know, is the, the slice of the pie chart for, for category K, and that is just going to be the, the information content or, or the entropy of that particular value of the multinomial. So we'll put that in there. And now this equation up top looks pretty simple. It's just linear in the energy of the, uh, or, or sorry, the, the entropy of the um, Dirichlet distribution is linear in the entropy of uh, the individual components of the multinomial distribution. And uh, information content is additive, so if you get more points, uh, if, you, if you get more data points, you can, you can add that information content, and that kind of explains uh, why, um, why it has such a beautiful uh, you know, update, update, uh, update function. So, so let's, let's watch this one update. Our prior right now is 1.2. 3.0 and 0 0.3. Um, we start off with a prior distribution. We haven't seen any data yet. We just have to assume something. We get a green point. It comes in. We update. We get a red one. Update that. We get another red one. Update that. Piece of cake. All right. So we have this alpha vector here that represents the Irish way. But, but how do we, I'm looking at these numbers here. How do we, uh, parse what this really means. When I see 1, 3, 2, um, how do I think in my mind what this uh, distribution is going to be looking like? Well, let's divide it into two components. 
Um, on the left side, we're going to normalize it. So we're going to make sure we're going to divide it all by six, so, so all of them sum to one. And then we're going to keep that sum on the right side. So uh, the left side represents the expected value of the distribution. So that you can think of, hey, that's, uh, that's the multinomial that we think is, uh, is expected for, for that row in, in this particular case. And then on the right side, we have some kind of a weight. And we're not sure what it means yet. But uh, in order to understand uh, what it means, uh, I'm going to draw an analogy to uh, normal distribution. Because most people understand normal distribution. If you, you, know, you talk to most people at your company or you, you're trying to explain something, uh, normal distribution is usually a good place to start because everybody kind of has a baseline um, intuition for what that is. So the normal distribution has a mean and a standard deviation. Uh, we already talked about the mean of the Dirichlet. Um, so how does the standard deviation fit in? Well, variance is the standard deviation squared. And precision is going to be 1 divided by the variance. So how does precision affect uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about a normal distribution? Well, if you have a very high precision, um, it's low standard deviation, you're very certain that the points that are going to be drawn from that normal distribution are going to be close to the mean. If you have a low precision, that's sort of the, uh, you know, that's sort of the graphs that are more spread out, uh, the points that are going to be drawn are going to be far away from the mean. So uh, the way that I like to think of it is that uh, this weight value is a lot like uh, precision in the normal distribution. So let's look. This is a, an example of a two-dimensional uh, Dirichlet distribution. That's also known as like the, the beta distribution. And we're going to watch this video. It's going to start out with a very high precision, and then it's going to go down. So whoops. How do I... Uh, how do I press play here? No. Hmm. Ah, here we go. OK. So now it's going down. OK. And at some point, so normal distribution just kind of spreads out infinitely, whereas uh, this uh, is, um, you know, this is a beta distribution, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's between 1 and 0, zero and 1. Um, and, you know, at some point it has nowhere else to spread out, so it just kind of climbs the walls. So <laughs> let's think about what that means here. Uh, whoops, no, I can't go forward. What if I just click? Yeah, there we go. So this is a high weight distribution. Um, here we have 40% blue, 40% red, 20% uh, Yellow. Uh, I think I chose an orangish, orangish yellow. Um, so that's the mean. And if you have a very high weight, then in every example, uh, you're going to be very close to the mean, which means you're going to get that same mix of points. If you have a very low weight distribution, then um, you're going to be close. You're going to be far away from the mean. And as far away from the mean as possible means you're at one of the corners of the simplex. In other words, one, you know, you're going to have a pie chart with one color dominating the whole thing. Um, but different colors might be selected at different times. So notice the difference between these two. Uh, you've got the same proportions of colors between the two of them. You know, the same dots. They're just organized a lot differently, each, each pull out of the Dirich thing. So, Another way to think of a, a Dirichlet distribution is an urn model. So this is an urn you know, uh, with uh, three colors, yellow, green, and, and blue. Or sorry, yellow, red, and blue. And um, change it up a little bit each slide. I don't know why. Um, so you could think of this as, a, as being 1, 1, 1. And then the rules are every time you pick a random um, color out of the urn, you put it back in. But then you put another one in of the same color. So it might look like this. We pulled out red, we put in another red. Now look, in the, second, in the next draw, you're going to be much more likely to pull out red. OK, and so you get this kind of rich get richer effect. Whereas if you already have a lot in the urn, you're going to get a lot more. So you might get yellow, but it's too late because red is already 
is already winning. Now, if your, uh, if your urn already has a lot of data in it, then it's going to be very hard to change the distribution over time. It's basically, you know, if you have thousands of, uh, of points in there, um, you've essentially converged. It's not going to change very much over time. Um, so what you could think of happening is that uh, a, a Dirichlet distribution it starts off with an urn and the configuration of whatever the alpha parameters are, and then you let that urn play out to the limit, and then whatever that limit is, that's the pull out of the, uh, that, that, that's the multinomial that you pulled out. So, um, yeah, so that just says that. Uh, okay. Um, and then I should point out the uh, Chinese restaurant process, which is kind of like your Dirichlet process, which is an infinite version of the Dirichlet. It can also be thought of like this. Um, in this case, you've got these uh, white data points. And whenever you pull out a white data point, you put it back. But then you pick a new color that you've never seen before and put it back in. So stuff like this might happen. And uh, what happens here is that uh, this, this thing could be used to model something where you have an infinite number of possibilities or a very large number of possibilities, maybe like uh, words that people are using um, in, a, in a certain language. Um, and the number of, of uh, white data points that you start with uh, is going to represent um, how, you know, how divide the data, how divide the pool is. So if you start with a very uh, low number of uh, white data points, then you're going to have one color dominating your, or like one word uh, dominating the entire, uh, you know, dominating the, the entire um, data set. If you have a large number of white balls, then you're going to have lots of different colors and it's going to be all mixed up. Um, okay. So let's go back to the tabular data that we see a lot um, over and over again. Um, so we have, um, we, we want each row to represent a multinomial, and we want to give each row a prior Dirichlet distribution. And so we have to ask ourselves, which prior Dirichlet distribution explains the data that we see? And what we could do is we could use Newton's method to find the most likely Dirichlet distribution that explains that data. Now, uh, current implementations of Newton's method um, well, all implementations of Newton's method require computing the gradient and the Hessian, the first derivative and the second derivative of that data. Um, but uh, usually that requires looping through the entire data set on each pass of Newton's method. And that could take a long time. So um, what I've done in uh, this, uh, I guess we'll send this out. You don't have to write this down. But uh, what I've done in a uh, kind of a just I wrote a Python script, it's open, you can all get it, is that it makes a pre-computation on the data. It, it compresses it in, uh, in an intelligent way so that you don't have to run through all of the data every time you want to find the, uh, uh, the, the, the Dirichlet that works. So uh, let's look at how this works. It's, it's, it's better to look at um, in terms of a, uh, uh, an illustration. And it works, very, uh, it works most well when you have lots of sparsely populated rows. And this is very true in something like for four square venues where we've got lots of venues, lots and lots and lots of them. We don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to loop through them a lot. Um, but each venue doesn't have a whole lot of reviews associated with it. You know, 100, 200, some have like six. And you want to make use of that too. So. Yeah. Oh, what, what's the data set? Okay, so the, so the question is, what do these rows represent? So um, let's say, I mean, I was using a traffic uh, analogy before. So if we're going to extend that analogy, then each row represents a different traffic light. And then each, uh, and then each data represents a, uh, uh, an observation of what happens when people stop at that traffic uh, and hit that traffic light. Um, so if you have a two column data set, like we use it at Foursquare for likes and dislikes, it would be two columns. Um, each, uh, each row represents a different venue. 
And then you know, the first column would be number of people who left a positive signal, and then the next column would be number of people who left a negative signal. So um, moving on, what does this compression look like? So uh, I compress it into all the data into this matrix, and um, the number of columns in the matrix is, I'm calling it M, and that's going to be the number of the maximum number of data points at each row. So usually it's more than six, but hopefully it's not that huge. Um, but yeah, that, that row could go on and on and on. And the number of columns, well, there are three columns for K, and then the bottom column represents totals. So how does this work? So, uh, right, so K is three, and M is six in this case. We read in one row, and we see that this row has one green and zero of everything else. And it counts one in the green row and one in the total row. Now we see this one has one in green, three in yellow, and two in red. And the way it counts it is that um, it puts in a maximum of one per cell, and then it counts forward. So for example, um, when that goes in, it, so it goes in like this. Uh, the green has one, so it's going to add one to the first column. The yellow has three, so it's going to add to the first three columns. And the red is two, so it's going to add to the first two columns. The total is six, so it's going to add everything on the bottom. And here's another one. Here's all six in yellow. And here's another one. Uh, here's, there are four total. So as it turns out, if you loop through all your data and you calculate this matrix, using just this matrix, um, you can uh, calculate the um, optimal Dirichlet without having to run through the data again. So uh, that's, uh, I'm working on an academic paper that, uh, um, that explains this in more detail. And the code that I have up does it. And we'll, we'll do a demo of that code, I think, right now. Uh, so uh, why don't I uh, disconnect for just a second so I could get my demo up. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Different track lines doing uh, different the underlying assumption that uh, different traffic lines uh polynomial distribution come from the same direct line. Oh, that's a good question. So the question was, do we make the assumption that each traffic light comes from the same Dirichlet distribution? Um, so it's different multinomial but same Dirichlet. And the answer is uh, yes, that's the assumption of this model. Um, so that's the simplest version. It's not, gonna, it's not the most expressive model possible, but you can imagine extending that, and we'll talk about that in a minute by doing a mixture model or something. Like that. Okay. Ooh, I better, uh, I better make this bigger. Okay. Has this? Can everybody see that? All right. I think we're. Pretty good. Um, uh oh. There you go. Okay. Good. Um, let me just look at what I've got going on here. So I've got a sampling tool, so I can uh, sample from a Dirichlet distribution. Sorry, I'm kind of uh, trying to. Uh, let's actually go a little smaller, just so that I can. That's not. All right. <laughs> I better uh, turn around or something. Uh, okay, I think I got it. Uh, so I can sample from a Dirichlet multinomial. Let me just give myself uh, help so that I know what I need. So n is the number that we want to sample. m is the number of samples per row. And a represents the alphas. So let's do that. Let's, let's generate 10 rows. Um, each row, let's do 20 data points for each row. And let's do, um, let's look at uh, a Dirichlet of uh, 1, 2, 1. Um, what's it saying here? Oh, I still have help. There we go. 
and there is our 20 rows. Now let's look at a, a Dirichlet that's got a much lower weight. So maybe I'll do 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.1. You see how the data is much less mixed up. There's a lot of zeros. There are a few where like 20 or, or 18 or almost of them are all one category. Um, let's do one that's a lot higher. Let's do, uh -oh. Takes a second, okay. Let's try 10, 20, 10. Now we can see that they're all roughly in the same. Okay, the next thing that I wanna do after this is um, there's another possibility where you could do a, a dash O, which kind of puts it in that form that I was talking about before. Uh, oh, how do we, oh, that's a zero. Oh, maybe it's just true. No. Oh, sorry? Oh, A is the, um, is alpha. So that's the, um, that, 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 that's the uh, Dirichlet parameters. Uh, let's actually look at help. <laughs> my own help. Oh, count matrix, that's what we want, okay. No? Oh, U matrix, okay. There we go. So that's just the, the matrix that uh, I was computing before that we could do it automatically. Okay, so now let's go back to this. And the idea is we have this data, how can we reconstruct what the most likely Dirichlet is from that data? And so we have the tool that does that as well. And that's, uh, find uh, Dirichlet prior. Actually, it'll probably tell me, oh, there we go. Um, I think I need to give it a K. Hang on a sec. Yeah, so I need to give it the number of categories. So in this case, we have three categories, and we're gonna turn verbose off. There we go. So just given this small data set, you know, it converges to 1.2, 2.5, 1.2, which is close to what we said, but because we didn't have a whole lot of data, uh, we couldn't really do it. Let's say we, we give it more data, we make N, you know, 1,000. We're looking at 1,000 rows here, which isn't even that much. Um, see, it gets much closer, 1.0, 1 1.9, 1 1.0. 1 um, and notice it could even deal with lower M values. So even if you only have, say, three values for each row, um, it still is not as close, but it still gets pretty close. Um, and notice how fast it is. Uh, basically, it takes that, uh, you know, it builds that matrix, and once, once you have that matrix, it's really, really fast. So. That's what, I, that's what I worked on. Yeah. If, if each row only has one data point? So, okay. Uh, so your question is what happens if, if each row only has one data point? So if, what's that? Well, so, so there's, there's a problem here because if each row, if all of your rows have only one data point, then it's impossible to find the weight of the Dirichlet because you have no idea how mixed up it is. Or not, right, because uh, remember uh, there, were, there was the circles that were mixed up and then the circles that were, um, were, were like uh, each point was the same color. If you're just drawing one value from each circle, you have no idea, you can't distinguish one from the other. But if you have rows with one data point in it mixed with other rows with more data points, then you can use that. You can use that to make a better prediction. So you could use that. Remote. Yeah. How do you choose alpha? Yeah. Um, well, so th that's what this, um, this script does. It, it chooses alpha for you. Yeah. So um, I'm giving it kind of fake data 
over here where I chose alpha and I generated the data. But usually what I'll do is I'll feed in um, my own data set, you know, um, from Foursquare data or, or whatever I'm working on. And then this find Dirichlet prior script will, will give me the alphas. So that's exactly what it does. Yeah. So to get to the final prior, yeah. Oh, right. So um, the way Newton's method works is, um, right, how many of you are familiar with Newton's method? So, okay, so like about half, half of you. Okay, so it uses um, the first derivative and the second derivative. It basically says, it, it picks a random value of alpha and some values are gonna be more likely than others and it's trying to climb the hill. It's trying to find the most likely value. And it'll say, okay, um, it'll find the prior, you know, which direction uh, should I be, it'll do gradient ascent, you know, which direction should I be going in? And then it uses the Hessian, the, the second derivative to figure out, okay, what's the learning rate? How fast should I be going in that direction? And then ultimately it converges on the optimal point. So you could start it anywhere. No matter where you start it, it always converges in the same point because, um, you yeah, know, this is a, it's a convex, uh, you know, it, it's a convex data set and it, it, it only has one maximum. Yes? Have you uh, seen it in your front representation versus any other algorithms? Uh, no, but that's a good question. That's, um, uh, that's something that uh, I'm trying to argue is like uh, something that we should look into because I think it, it could, um, but uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, Oh, so the, the three parameters are the, alpha, are the alphas that represent the distribution. So uh, Dirichlet distribution, you know, we saw before that it's, it's, um, it's parameterized by alpha. So if you just give the alpha, that represents the whole distribution. So, all right, let me, uh, let me go back uh, uh, to my slides. Um, I'm going to have to unplug this for a second just so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, and then we could go back into this into the questions. Just a few more. Sometimes when you plug this back in, it kind of uh, blinks a lot. Okay. That was the demo. Okay. So this is just an example of a while back. Um, I fed in all the data on Foursquare of... Uh, venue popularity by week hour uh, because we were we had made the assumption beforehand that a venue would be equally popular any time of the week like doesn't matter 4 a.m. 4 p.m. equally popular and we said well we should make some assumption about the venue that's not that uh, when it first starts out and so we put all the data into this algorithm and this is what it spit out this is the 168 dimensional prior and so you could see um, even before collecting data about a venue, we're going to be assuming that it, it's a lot more popular at 4 a.m. than at 4 p.m. And this is good because then, you know, otherwise new venues, we're going to look at old venues and we're going to say, well, this is an old venue. It's not going to be very popular at 4 a.m. And then we're going to look at a new venue and we're saying, well, we don't have any data for it. So, okay, flat. And then 4 a.m. all of a sudden looks a lot better. But that's not true. Yeah. So. Uh, what this does is it kind of puts the old venues and the new venues on an equal playing field. Um, okay, so now I just want to kind of, uh, um, and you mentioned this a little bit, sort of expand. How, how could we use this? How can we expand beyond just this plain old, you know, Dirichlet model? So I kind of gave an analogy between Dirichlet's and normal distributions, Gaussians. So it seems to me that anything that you would want to do with Gaussians, you can also do with Dirichlet's. You can do it in the same way. So if you want to use the EM algorithm uh, to find the mixture of Gaussians using uh, a data set, you know, you could use the EM algorithm to find a mixture of Dirichlet's using a data set. I'm sure it's done all the time. Um, and let's suppose, uh, let's make, say we want to make it a little more complicated. 
Let's say we want to assume that each row is a mixture of multinomials that are chosen elsewhere, and that the coefficient of each multinomial, uh, the, the coefficients are themselves multinomial, and they are drawn from a Dirichlet. Uh, so what is that? It turns out that that's a latent Dirichlet allocation that's equivalent to a topic model, which you know, I'm sure is talked about in this meetup sometimes, and, um, in a lot of, uh, a lot of machine learning talks. Um, and so that's an interesting thing to think about because, it, you know, why would you want to have a very low weight on that Dirichlet? If you have a very low weight, it means that each document that you read is going to be dominated by a single topic. And the more topics that you add to the document, the more penalized um, that model is going to be. Um, so that's good. For, um, for labeling documents and, and giving, that, giving it that low weight is going to be good for making sure that uh, those documents get very clear, um, uh, very clear topic labels. Um, for those of you who, who know about topic modeling or, or have seen it before. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to end with that. Obviously, uh, it's something uh, to, to look into further. Um, but yeah, it helps to understand if you, if you're looking at, uh, if you're going to talk about LDA or topic models, I've, I feel like, I mean, you know, it's one of the, the talks I, was, I had gone to a bunch of talks about that early on, you know, when I was first getting into machine learning, and I realized it helps to have a good grasp of what the Dirichlet is uh, in order to understand those things. So I hope this talk helped with that. Um, so that's all I have. You guys have any more questions? Yes, I'll go with you. Okay, so the question is, we have a row with zero data, zero, zero, zero. And what distribution do you want? So the answer to that is that um, you're gonna wanna use the prior. So every row is given uh, a prior. That's the, a Dirichlet distribution before you've seen any data. And um, that's the prior that's gonna be used at that row when you have zero, zero, zero. And what prior you use is what the, the script that was showing calculates. But you have to have lots of rows in order to get a good prior. Um, if you don't have any rows and you don't know what to do, there's not much you can do. You just have to kind of guess. Yeah. So you were mentioning old venues and new venues. And right. You have less data than new venues. Right. You take that data from the other venues, the older venues, right? That's where you're talking about the one. Yes. So what happens if that new venue happens to be like an outlier? So right. you're saying that the old venue Right, so um, notice that the uh, weight, let's look at this. I mean, the weight of this distribution is not that high. Um, I think it was around 30 or something. So 30 check-ins, 30 pieces of data can override or can match this data. So, I mean, you know, look at 4 a.m. is around, you know, 0 0.1, right? If the first check-in is at four, between four and five, that column all of a sudden jumps to one which is on the top of the, you know, where the title is. So as more data comes in, uh, it, the distribution moves away from the prior and then it starts to match uh, what the data is saying. Um, so yeah, um, in this case, about 30 to 100 check-ins will override the prior and I think that's about right. Yeah, in the back. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's a very good point. Um, by breaking up the weekday into 168 um, different buckets and different hours, uh, we lose a lot of information. Uh, one information that you know obviously we use is like where in the hour that check-in occurred. Totally lost that. And another is the fact that. Um, you know, this, the time has structure, and uh, you know, if people are checking in at 4, 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., uh, they probably will be checking in at 3 a.m. I don't know. Or if someone's checking in at one bucket, they might be more likely to check into the next bucket. And 
I haven't, uh, I've thought about some ways to make use of that, you know, smoothing across buckets and things like that, um, but uh, haven't, haven't really done it yet. I haven't really needed it yet. Um, but uh, that's uh, definitely something to keep in mind and something to think about. I think all the different ways to do that are a little bit out of scope, but, but uh, it's a good question. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think I got that entirely. Yeah. So, so, so we're looking for outliers that, that are going to be very different from this distribution? Right. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, so one thing we could do is, you know, uh, I think what you're saying is, you know, maybe we want to build a mixture model that are just different types of venues. Like these are, in this category here might be, you know, bars uh, in general. And so th this is like where all the bars are open. And so if I'm a new bar, maybe I want to go in there. And then over here is like, you know, 24 hour diners. And over here is like workplaces. Um, and then, as a venue come in, maybe we know the category already, or maybe as some data starts trickling in, it becomes clear, well, it's a, it's a clear outlier in this mixture, so it, and it definitely seems like it fits in here, so we'll put it in here. And yeah, so if we did it that way, um, I think it would, uh, we, we converge the right answer a lot closer, uh, or a lot, a lot quicker, so you're right about that. Um, haven't needed to do it uh, just because generally, um, the only problem is new venues, and after a while, uh, we have enough data. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if we were serious about doing that, I, that that would help. Yes. So we've been trying to use uh, this for essentially like classifying names to see uh, ethnicities. We have a problem with like uh, essentially the amount of samples for one ethnicity uh, can be so great that it'll start to sub like subdividing that before identifying other types of Obvious clusters. Um, so, okay, so the question is we're talking about uh, names that are being classified into different um, ethnicities. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm going to make, ask if, the, if this is right. Um, so if you, you have data like this, where each row is a different name and each column is a different ethnicity and you have these, uh, you have these counts. Um, but, and your question is how do we divide up the eth ethnicities? So the, the names are actually like each, each token is a feature. Oh, token of the name. Yeah, we have a quantity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, so uh, I don't know if this is necessarily uh, the most uh, appropriate model. You might, you might want to do, um, um, you might want to do analysis on like, uh, well, actually, no, you might want to look at, you know, for, for each token, let's say each row is a token, you know, you might want to give each token uh, uh, percentages, like assign it a multinomial for each, uh, uh, for each possible ethnicity. And then when you have a bunch of tokens, you can kind of come up with a system for combining them. Um, maybe it's naive base or something like that. Uh, yeah, I think that would be. Um, but what was your original question in terms of dealing with the? Oh, we just get found good answer for it. Okay, why don't you talk to me afterwards? I'll, uh, I'll we'll get into more detail. Yes. Yes. Can you go back to the top model? Yeah. That you showed the slide. Yeah. A little bit of an afterthought, I admit, but interesting yes. ideas. This is a picture from. Now, each, each topic is a. It's a, yeah, it's a multinomial distribution of words. Now, right. if I wanted to look for a word in the distribution, I'd have to then do a distribution of all the words in the distribution to find the last, the last element of the history for the word, correct? The, sorry, the, the last, the last Right, yeah. right. Oh, so, so you're looking at, right, so I, 
So the question about the how LDA works, I don't necessarily want to get into like the whole model uh, here, but you know, so uh, each document is considered um, a mixture of topics, and each topic is a mixture of words. Sorry. Right. And it goes, and then it collects words inside the topic. Yes. Okay. So each, each topic is a mixture of words. Okay. So for example, if you, yes. you can think of a, a topic, you can think of like words that represent yes. that topic. And then each document is a mixture of topics. So some documents are just going to be all about one topic. And then some are going to be a few topics. But you want a very small number of topics, and that's why you keep that Dirichlet higher uh, below. Yes. Uh, this is the last slide. Oh, which one are you talking about? This one. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Okay. This this graph, yeah, this graph represents a Dirichlet distribution. This is a 168-dimensional Dirichlet distribution. And each value of alpha is represented by the bar. So then how does this link to the representation How does this what? How does this link to the work you are doing? Oh, right. Well, I mean, popularity of a venue at a given time is an input to our recommendation engine. It's not. <laughs> It's not a very big one, uh, but it's, it's one of them. Obviously, we want to show places that are open or likely to be open. And if a place is new, we want to be able to make a good guess. Yeah? Uh, do I see application to prediction? Uh, can you give me a little more? Yeah. Right. Would this be a direct solution to actually give that? Um so I mean so you're you're talking about like I think you're talking about like um, um you know classification problem in machine learning. Uh and then the I don't think that the um just applying one Dirichlet over every row is very good at classifying the rows. Um, but if you were to do something a little more complicated, like build a mixture model, and then for each row figure out which which mixture it goes into, that could be something that uh, that produces some good classifications in each row. And then it would be good because each or good or each row, like if it doesn't have enough data, you'd know that, and you'd know we don't know which cluster it's in yet. And then as the data rolls in, it becomes more obvious which cluster to, to put it in. Um, all right, uh, one more. What's the relationship between this one and compared to like a larger set thing at count? If we take the data, not like the average. If we just take the average, does it look like this? Is what you're asking. So if we take the average uh, 168 vector, for four square venues. We took them and we averaged them all together. What does it look like? Well, the distribution looks a lot like this, but the weight is, I mean, we don't get a weight from that. We just get, uh, we just get a distribution. Uh, so, um, so, yes, if you, if you had an idea of what weight you wanted and you just wanted to take an average and crunch it, you could do that. All right, I think, uh, I think we're good. If there are any other questions, you can come to me after, but uh, thank you very much.